does everyone think of when they hear the word plantation? For most of us that have access to American education or culture, it probably has to do with tobacco, cotton, or other cash commodities. However, the word plantation was not used by early modern colonial settlers in this context. The Puritans of New England, for instance, used plantation to mean planting Christian values and culture into a new land, and sometimes a new people. See the seal of Rhode Island. There was controversy over the word plantation and the motto in recent years due to the violent racial history of the United States. However, that is because the context of the word and how Anglophones think about it has changed since the early modern period. Both the Spanish and the British American colonizers brought a medieval Christian crusaders mentality of so-called spiritual gardening with them to the new world. Spiritual gardening is the idea that by converting non-believers to Christianity, by nurturing their spirituality, one is growing and furthering Christian ideals. Thus, it relates back to the early modern use of the word plantation. How is this idea of spiritual gardening related to the urban design in the colonial period in the Americas? First, the Spanish and the British considered colonization to be a form of spiritual gardening. After the Spanish and later the British arrived in the Americas, by using town planning and design, they sought to change the social hierarchy of indigenous Americans and establish a legitimacy for their regimes. The Spanish and British regimes both brought Renaissance ideas of town planning from the old country to the Americas and wrought cultural, social, and political transformation on indigenous Americans' way of life. The reason why I am comparing the Spanish and the British is due to the English language scholarship on the colonial period of the Americas, which usually presents a binary between the two models of colonization. Briefly speaking, the Spanish model is Catholic mercantilist and integrates the existing indigenous Americans into their social order. The British model is Protestant, motivated by religious freedom and displaces the indigenous Americans. I believe that the line separating these models is finer than existing scholarship presents. In the case of urban design, it may even be blurred or non-existent. And if we look away from the Protestant-Catholic distinction, the religious and consequently cultural change brought by both groups of colonizers have the same motivation in medieval traditions. Today, I will be comparing the urban designs of Spanish and British American colonial settlements to show the similarity between the two models. Before we start comparing urban designs between colonial regimes, I should explain what the grid pattern is and where it came from. The grid pattern, otherwise known as the chess or checkerboard pattern, is what it sounds like. See the example on the left from cl classical antiquity. The grid pattern has a long history stretching back millennia. The Greeks and Romans used it for control of physical space and therefore as tool of social and ultimately political control of its inhabitants. Their principles of design, including the use of the grid pattern, were rediscovered and reworked by Renaissance architects. Many of these Renaissance architects wrote treatises or painted what they called the ideal city. The Renaissance ideal city was usually one of two plan types. The concentric or radial city plan, which is characterized by curved streets, and the rectangular diagonal oriented plan, which was often grid patterned. Why was the grid pattern popular in antiquity, and why was interest revived during the Renaissance having its eventual manifestation in the Atlantic Basin? First, it facilitates military control. Straight streets with right angles make for efficient navigation for troops and optimize line of sight. Second, it is a generic plan which can usually be applied to a large variety of unseen, therefore unknown site conditions. Third, it's good for equitable property distribution due to its geometrical symmetry. It also lends easily to future expansion without altering the organic unity of the city. Fourth, it is the easiest plan to lay out with crude instruments of survey and measurement. A cord of rope will suffice. Fifth, for compact settlements, it is the most efficient use of space. And last, the grid pattern is good for trade centers because it prioritizes circulation of traffic. 
Its disadvantages are relatively less in number. First, a radial plan, as opposed to the grid, is easier to navigate and intuitively find the center of town. And it also affords better communication starting from the center of town moving outwards. Second, sometimes the topography of the site does not lend itself easily to a grid, especially if in hilly or mountainous country. Now that we have an idea and picture of the grid pattern, we can move on to its implementation in Spanish and British America. The Spanish used the grid pattern to geographically expand the reach of their political power to benefit the crown and certain elite economic and social groups in Spain and what would become major cities in the Americas, such as vice regal capitals, Mexico City and Lima, for instance. In other words, the Spanish established colonial settlements to secure control over land and resources. According to Jill L. Grant, scholar of urban and planning history and theory, the grid pattern was used in Spanish America as a means of globalizing their authority. Early British settlements in the Americas, on the other hand, used the grid pattern to distribute land equally. In particular, I am referring to the Puritan communities in New England, who used church membership as a qualifier of who was a free man and therefore who had right to land and other suffrage. By distributing land equally, power and authority are also equally distributed and diffused. The quintessential colonial Spanish American city was characterized by a plaza, central plaza centered on a grid pattern. Here on this plan of Lima, you can see the white spot in the center. That's the central plaza. The central plaza consisted of several blocks which contained the major civic and religious buildings, the town council, also called the cabildo, the cathedral or church, and the treasury and administrative centers. Additionally, if applicable, arcades where retail trade was conducted were all located on the periphery of this plaza. The urban elite lived closest to this plaza and the city was racially and occupationally segregated. The central plaza therefore ordered the social hierarchy of the city. Moving on to British America. The nine square plan used by the Puritans in New England had a central lot which contained the meeting hall, the church and public green space. This was an open grid, meaning it was not fortified. The other eight lots contained houses. These were individual buildings, each with their own green space. This was an urban plan which simultaneously centralized and decentralized power. It centralized power through the meeting house, which functioned as the religious, political, and cultural center of town, in addition to being a physical reference point and land strategy. In other words, the individually standing homes of the residential lots afforded visibility of the meeting house from multiple points of view. The meeting house was also larger than other buildings in the community, hence its use as a visual reference point. The plan decentralized power through equally sized plots for each free man. Although initially, it may seem like the Spanish and British models distributed authority and power differently. This equal distribution of power in the British model only included European grown men or free men. Like the Spanish, it generally disenfranchised the indigenous Americans. Additionally, Puritan suffrage was not universal as women did not have the same rights as men. Indigenous Americans and blacks were appropriated for their labor and denied representation in government in various degrees of <laughs> Despite the different uses of the grid plan, the use of imposed urban space as the means of asserting dominion and facilitating conversion and assimilation as well as spreading the culture of colonists is found in both British and Spanish American settlements. The most mobile communities of both empires, the merchants, migrants, soldiers, and wealthy travelers were the ones who saw the grid pattern wherever they went in the empire. They were also the groups which held the empire together economically and incidentally. What they saw and did as members of the empire helped form an idea of cultural identity within each regime. Now we will move on to our first case study. We will start in Spain. 
Social control of cities is the first step in attaining economic and political hegemony. The Catholic monarchs, Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain, understood this. They gradually expelled the Muslims during the Christian reconquest of Spain, the Reconquista, by using a system of autonomous city-states or municipalities which combined a surrounding rural area with an urban core. These cities were used as stepping stones for invading Muslim territory. The towns in reconquered southern Spain fall into two categories, those built before the Reconquista and those built after. Two towns in southern Spain built after the Reconquista are possible precedents for the development of the colonial Spanish-American city. The first of these towns is Santa, Santa Fe in Granada, Spain. It was built in the grid pattern approximately 10 miles from the gates of Granada. It had a plaza in which the cathedral and seat of local government were located. The second town is in Puerto Real, Cadiz. It has the same layout as Santa Fe, but on a larger scale. In both of these towns where the mosque was demolished, a cathedral was built on that same site. By replacing the mosque, the cathedral became the new civic symbol of the town. The Spanish crown initially allowed governors and captains to determine town settlements and formation in the earliest settlements in the Americas, which were in the Caribbean. However, the crown realized that proper planning principles were needed for sustainable and long-lasting settlements, and so Renaissance ideals were transplanted over the Atlantic. The first grid pattern settlement in Spanish America was Santo Domingo in Hispaniola, which is modern-day Dominican Republic. Santo Domingo resembles Santa Fe in Spain more than later Spanish-American cities. Like Santa Fe, its settlement was centered around its plaza and cathedral. The plaza was a side yard for the cathedral in Santa Fe and Santo Domingo, just as the plaza was once a side yard for the mosque. This was not a large central plaza like that of the typical Spanish-American city. Hernan Cortes built Mexico City in accordance with royal instructions. Cortes had been reluctant to destroy Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire. He wanted to capture it, but doing so without its destruction proved impossible. So he rebuilt it, renaming it Mexico City, and replicating and imposing the Spanish onto pre-existing indigenous socioeconomic, political, and religious structures. Where the markets had been, colonial plazas replaced them. The cathedral was built over the site of the Aztec Pyramid. The national palace built where Moctezuma II's houses had been. Houses of the merchant elite were closest to the central plaza, then artisans, and finally unskilled labor. Those indigenous Americans who had survived Cortez's invasion were required to live in segregated outer districts called barrios. Additionally, the clergy, especially the Franciscans, Dominicans, and later the Jesuits, founded many Indian towns. Also in the grid pattern, with the church's main emphasis, these towns were built for the purposes of Christianizing the indigenous peoples and also to appropriate their labor. By segregating the living areas of the two populations, indigenous communities were physically and spatially controlled, and the social hierarchy of Spanish-American cities was ordered by socioeconomic and racial status. All Spanish expeditions of discovery and conquest in the Americas were undertaken with the goal of reaching an indigenous city. Like the Christian reconquest of Spain, the method of relying on cities as stepping stones and conquest was used in the Americas. The grid pattern with the central plaza was the favored urban design used for reordering indigenous ways of life. Incidentally, by the conquest of Mexico, the grid pattern was fast becoming the accepted model of a proper town. The Americas offered the Spanish a chance to implement urban design ideas without having to exercise eminent domain. The Spanish were able to transplant the Renaissance version of the Roman grid pattern over to the Americas where it transformed. The presence of the small plazas of Santa Fe, Granada, and Puerto Real in Spain I'm sorry, Puerto Real and Cadiz were overshadowed by the cathedrals in Spain. In the Americas, 
The Spanish were inspired by both the Renaissance ideal city and the original layout of indigenous urban centers to concentrate all the buildings of church and state in the central plaza. The Spanish-American grid pattern city is a hybrid urban design of the European Renaissance and indigenous America. The place of Santa Fe in Puerto Real in Spain and Santo Domingo in Mexico City in the Americas within the development of the Spanish-American city is not only indicative of a flow of culture from Europe to the Americas, but also a flow of culture between different Spanish colonies. The Puritan, the British case study, this is New Haven. The British, like the Spanish, took precedence from the Romans. They followed Roman law, which stated that possession of territory required physical presence and the ability to control and defend the territory. What connects the Puritan and Spanish American early town planning is the use of the grid pattern. The Spanish laws of the Indies based town planning ordinances on Roman principles mitigated by the Renaissance. They believed that beauty derived from order, not just social order, but uniformity of appearance in streets, circulation, and buildings. The Puritan nine square plan, as seen in the town of New Haven, was also based on Roman principles. However, the Puritans based their plan on the Vitruvian man with the human body as a model of perfection. For the Puritans of New England, bonds of Christian love, face-to-face -face human interactions, and maintenance of a close-knit community would help keep social order and discipline. For the Puritans, visibility of neighbors was important to maintaining order. In addition to the nine squares, the Puritan town was surrounded by tracts of cultivated land which they also considered a part of their town. Only that which was not visibly touched by settlers' presence was considered untamed, uncolonized, and unchristian. This association of European Christian identity with urban townscape and order through design juxtaposed with the association of Native Americans to the untamed wilderness influenced the missionary work of the New England Puritans. Like the Spanish, the Puritans too built towns for the Indians alone, called praying towns. One of the reasons the Massachusetts Bay Company listed for Puritan colonization of New England was duty towards conversion of Native American inhabitants to Christianity, and a key strategy was the founding of praying towns, where converts could live together and prepare to earn church membership by learning from an English minister. John Eliot was a famous proponent of this mission and strategy. He wanted praying Indians to be accepted as full church members by the colonial North American churches because suffrage was gained through church membership. This was a long and complex process. Praying Indians and their colonial sponsors had to convince an English audience that they were motivated by genuine spirituality rather than material gain by proving their theological <laughs> In 1659, a group of praying Indians successfully gained church membership. These were Algonquin peoples who lived in the town of Natick, which used the nine square plan. Natick was widely regarded as a success, and 10 more praying towns were modeled after it by 1674. Similar to the Spanish, who used Indian towns to impose European religious and cultural values, the British used praying towns to affect spiritual and material change of values in Native Americans. In Puritan New England, praying Indians and missionaries used the urban space of praying Indian towns to present its inhabitants as serious candidates for church membership. Once Indians moved into a praying town, they were also expected to adopt European ideas of land ownership and use. Prior to first contact, the Algonquins shared the resources of the land with other groups moving seasonally to hunt and gather. In praying towns, they fence cultivated fields instead. The early modern dichotomy of urban space to civilized English contrasted with wilderness associated with savage Native Americans led to both a symbolic cultivation of Native American Christian spirituality. In addition to a literal cultivation of European Moors and the indigenous Americans, while some British settler communities, such as the Puritans, did not forcefully impose sovereignty on the indigenous Americans, the intent to change religious and cultural values of the indigenous peoples through town planning and control was the same as the Spanish. 
To conclude, both the Spanish and the British American grids symbolically and ideologically reordered the social hierarchy by moving the indigenous peoples to the perimeter of town in the former case, and in the latter case, trying to change their ideas of land and resource ownership. The emphasis I am trying to make is not just that both groups use the grid pattern, but also that they imposed urban design on indigenous peoples of the Americas in order to assert dominion and establish legitimacy in a new social order. The presence of the church and government buildings in the center of town meant that the power of church and state emanated from the center of the town out towards the wilderness. Both the Catholic and Protestant traditions saw colonization as a form of spiritual gardening and were based in the medieval tradition of crusader mentality and Christian conversion. Both Catholic and Protestant traditions juxtaposed the European townscape to the Indian wilderness. Both traditions use spatial partitioning to facilitate supervision and through circulation of people and neighborly relationships, self and communal discipline and policing of behavior. These two traditions may have diverged, but they are ultimately from the same medieval traditions, and though different, they are still similar.